Hello, welcome to This Is Not A Watermelon. My name is Mikey Mhenna. Today on the series, we have Yazid uh, Anani, who is a curator, uh, uh, an academic, a scholar, who is working at Al Qattan Foundation and has uh, been the driving force behind an exhibit entitled uh, Gaza, A Moment of Becoming. Uh, this episode is being filmed on March 19th at 10 a.m. in Palestine. Uh, Yazid, welcome. Welcome. Thank you for uh, having me on the show. Yeah, it's uh, it's super, super nice having you on. Um, so maybe let's just uh, center the, the conversation around the exhibit to start. Um, if you were just to give a, a brief introduction to what Gaza Moment of Becoming is, um, to people who may not be familiar with uh, Qatan and may not be familiar with um, the the important role that that space and that institution serves in uh, Ramadan and Palestine and beyond. Uh, well, thank you for the question. Uh, it's not an ordinary exhibition. That's what I'm going to start with. Uh, it, uh, everything occurred after the seventh of October, uh, the genocide happening in Gaza and the herbicide, uh, whereby artists, Palestinian artists from exile and also Palestine, uh, saying from Gaza, from 1948 to Palestine, from the West Bank and Jerusalem, uh, they gathered several times discussing what is the role of art and uh, how can we contribute as an artist to this particular moment of becoming changing. Uh, this transformation should really also impact our work as artists and our thought. Uh, the practices of art should not really go on the same way uh, it used to be. So what does it mean art now and uh, who is the artist now and what kind of movement artists can uh, uh, push for? Uh, and that was really the essential uh, components of the exhibition. So we have we met at the Qatam Foundation. There were several uh, individual artists and institutions, such as the Palestinian Museum, representatives from there, uh, Bizet University Museum, uh, uh, Al-Hosh, uh, in Jerusalem, as well as the uh, VAP, which is the uh, an institution that is uh, uh, dedicated for teaching art to children uh, and informal art practices to also adults. Uh, and so we all gathered at Qatam Foundation and we had several conversations. Uh, and then at the end, we decided that uh, we should really do an exhibition. And this is the exhibition uh, that we decided to do, but it wasn't really aimed at exhibiting arts inspired by or really affected by what has happened since uh, the 7th of October. But essentially, it was also asking these questions about the art and uh, art movement and what is the importance of art today. Yeah. Uh, so this is the essence of the exhibition. Yeah. You know, it's... I did something that I typically do, which I'm trying to catch myself on, is um, I didn't really ask you, Kifak, Kif Halak, and no, and you're in Ramallah right now. We're speaking virtually, um, and it's almost like I sometimes forget to ask who I'm speaking to. I also also forget to ask myself. <laughs> but Kif Halak, how's your? How are you? Well, thank you. I mean, keep halna kulna. I guess it's. Uh, I think we have to open it up collectively rather than yeah. uh, having it in this duality between both of us. Because I think it's uh, it's a moment whereby everyone is really feeling with the other, and it's a moment where uh, humanity is provoked uh, in its uh, core values. And I think keep halna ehna is the question now. Uh, I'm. Personally, I'm fine in comparison to what is happening right now in Gaza and elsewhere in the world as well. Uh, so let's not also forget what is happening elsewhere. And I think um, uh, this is this is a, a this is a moment where I'm provoked to do things. Uh, rather, some uh, some other people would really like to watch TV and follow up what is happening uh, on the news. Uh, uh, maybe express their feeling of anger, the emotions that uh, they have right now, seeing all these images and really following up uh, 
the genocide in Gaza. But then I think it's also a moment where we should really propel uh, our work, our institutions, our networks to make a difference. So this is how I feel. Yeah. When you when you put together an exhibit like this, I wonder if it makes you feel more um, connected or more alone. Well, this is really a tough question. Uh, first of all, it wasn't me alone putting the exhibition up uh, uh, because we decided to divide the uh, artist community into two groups. One is the selection committee. And the artists decided that this is as uh, as important as any other exhibitions. The quality of the art should really be uh, questioned. Mm. Uh, so there was a committee to select the art. Ones, and then there was a committee to mount the exhibition. I, I was part of the committee, mounting and curating the exhibition. Uh, and we had, of course, these conversations and sometimes arguments and disagreements, which was really fun. So I didn't feel alone in, per se. So the questions were... were going from an institutional level to the grass grassroots level, also with conversation with Gazans, uh, now in Gaza or uh, escaped Gaza now, or, or, you know, artists originally from Gaza or Palestinian artists from different generations all over the world. So never felt alone. Yeah. Uh, it's one of the time, one of the few exhibitions that I felt, I felt connected uh, with uh, a buddy of, uh, artists uh, with a with a huge corpse of artists all over this world, uh, plus the other casual conversations I have with my peers also uh, here and abroad. So uh, no, I think I felt connected this time. Yeah. Uh, unlike other exhibitions where I've particularly done for the Qatan Foundation with specific groups of artists. Would you feel comfortable mentioning some of the artists who were featured as part of the exhibit, just um, almost to give people names to look up and uh, people to check out? Yes. Uh, well, I don't remember all the artists because yeah. this, exhibitions, uh, this exhibition had something about 164 artists. Amazing. And some of them I don't know. I never really met in my life. Uh, they're new artists. Uh, all the time, which is really good as well. So we're exploring frontiers in terms of Palestinian art. Uh, so uh, we have all the generation uh, committed artists like Sliman Mansour, Nabil Anani, Vera Tamari, Taysil Barakat, uh, Samira Badran. And we have also uh, uh, well-established artists, the younger in generation, such as uh, Taysil Batniji, Hani Zorob, um, who else, uh, I would say, uh, uh, well, uh, I'm, I'm trying to remember, sure. Bashar Haroub, for example. And we have younger generation of artists, uh, uh, people I, I don't know, uh, people I never really met. And uh, I would really mention Majd uh, 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 al-Masri, for example, Bashar. Uh, Hala uh, and other artists. So there are many, many, many artists I know and many artists I don't know. Uh, so these are some of the names that I can uh, yeah. now recall. When you think about what Palestinian art, visual arts looks like um, over the course of the last hundred years of, you know, this um, occupation and sort of the, the uh, violent presence of Zionists in Palestine, can you, as a, as a curator, think about specific uh, phases and generations and split things up into themes? And if so, are we entering into a new theme and into a new phase? Well, this is really a tough question as well, because so many art historians, whether international or Palestinians, in yeah. origin try to historicize uh, uh, Palestinian art. But then I have a different sort of take on the way we conceptualize, uh, we think about art history, because it's not the history of the works of art for me. It's the history also, the engagement of artists in their community. I always give examples such as uh, 
uh, Vera Tamari is a committed artist. Uh, we know her. Uh, we know her work in pottery, and we know also her, her different inter interventions in different mediums. But then Vera, unlike other artists, she she established Bizet University Museum. She she established uh, courses in the arts in Bizet University. She supported many young architects and artists to become curators, to become established artists. And institutionally, she was behind the emergence of so many individuals who actually uh, left uh, an impact on the art scene. So this normally does not is not really taken into consideration in the history, historicizing what is art in Palestine. Uh, as much as they look at the product, and this is really a neoliberal um, capitalist way of really looking at the product as a means of understanding history, but then, no, it's not like that. So, I mean, for me, history is a little bit more uh, uh, more complex. And uh, what I would say that uh, uh, there, there, was, there were artists uh, from the beginning of last century uh, 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 more painting the landscape, educated abroad, most mostly in France, maybe in Turkey, uh, and uh, 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 there wasn't an art movement, uh, I would say. Uh, but then, after, uh, let's say, in uh, Smail Shammut and his establishment of uh, the uh, Department of Media and Culture in the, the PLO. He hosted so many artists and the art movements pushed forward, especially at that political and uh, political uh, particular moment in time where the non-aligned movement was established uh, worldwide. Mm. And the non-aligned movement was uh, based on the emergence of all these nations outside the colonialism, uh, independence from the colonial regimes, France, Britain, and the European in general, all over the world. So this, uh, these new nations uh, decided to ally and build a new, a third, uh, a third uh, uh, front, a, th a front against the Western uh, uh, hegemony and Western uh, interventions in, in the global South. And the non-aligned as as nations, uh, uh, they established also a cultural, uh, cultural uh, front, and this cultural front has its own values. Uh, based on the individual particularity of each country, its history, its folklore, its uh, and uh, together they tried to form a network of cultural exchange at that time, whereby uh, uh, the PLO was really part of it until the seventies and eighties, and this exchange between visual artists in Palestine uh, uh, and the bigger than aligned uh, uh, geography was uh, essential in. Uh, polishing the values of uh, the Palestinian art mm. movement at that time, indirectly, well, I would say. I, mean, I think Smail Shamut was very aware of that because he was really partaking in so many exhibitions all over the world, uh, displaying uh, Palestinian art in uh, uh, Eastern Europe, especially Yugoslavia. It was very active uh, with the Palestinian uh, cause at that time. Uh, but then also there was a movement in, in the West Bank uh, the movement we we call it the committed art movement. It was uh, cent centered around the uh, art league, uh, Palestinian art league. Who was uh, who was artists. running the League of Artists at that time? It was it was always new elected people. So it was Sliman Mansour, Nabil Anani, sometimes and uh, other people, and it was gathering all the artists. And actually, we were inspired by this exhibition from that period of Amazing. time because they they were they were. Uh, uh, hosting an exhibition each year with a different title and a, a group exhibition is done and then the discussion around the arts was uh, happening and uh, they had exhibition each year so we, we were following that movement. Uh, but continuing on the art history this has of course uh, changed and shifted during the first intifada so four of the artists decided to uh, go rogue and they decided to do a new uh, movement called uh, New Visions, oh, in, uh, in Arabic, Nahwa Tajrib wal Ibda. And they decided that let's really quit symbolism 
uh, uh, we, we, we're using so much symbolism in, uh, you know, the olive tree, the uh, Al-Aqsa, Qubbat al-Sakhra, uh, a hand with barbed wire, a pigeon for peace. Let's really quit all these symbols. I mean, they are, uh, they are, they are so much, uh, now uh, they're being used too much and now they just lost, I mean, they're banal right now. So let's mm. really invent a new movement. And what they did actually is uh, inspired by the first intifada and the grassroots uh, social movement that was happening. So they decided instead of representing the village and representing all these symbols, they decided to go to the village and bring ma organic material to their paintings. So they borrowed material and they just pasted it on their painting. So Slimad Mansour, for example, used uh, hay and uh, mud, yeah. uh, the, the hay and mud used in building so many structures in villages, such as the taboon, where we, uh, uh, from which we eat khubaz al-taboon. And then Vera Tamari looked for charts, pottery charts, and uh, from the nature, because it's all over the landscape in Palestine, yeah. because of older civilization. She, play, uh, she pasted them in, into her new works with new porcelain and, and pottery. While Taisir Barakat used old wood from uh, uh, from uh, recycled uh, wood, and uh, he used it for his uh, painting. And Nabil Anani, the uh, the skin and the leather of uh, of uh, animals that is in Hebron, uh, uh, used after uh, after you know uh, uh, slaying the animal and you know eating uh, yeah. feasting on, on meat and selling the meat so there's the skin and he so used it in palestine on, becomes so, the the sort of the building blocks of the art not only the subject yeah so i mean yeah it's 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 taking the what they used to represent and taking it inside the painting and this is sort of a, a movement towards more contemporary practices and uh, not only the classical uh, way of representing uh, symbols and uh, and uh, uh, documenting the landscape and the folklore. So this was really a shift. And the final shift is after Oslo, where, whereby uh, up till now, actually, yeah, we can really also divide it into different shifts, uh, phases. Uh, so what happened is that we opened to the internet. So everybody, after the uh, uh, Oslo interim agreements and the peace accords, uh, the international uh, world was really interested in us. So we had uh, museums, curators, biennials interested in Palestinian art. So we were a big influx of people coming from uh, Europe in particular, coming to Palestine and trying to hunt for Palestinian art and artists. And this is really a different phase uh, because uh, art as a market value has become very, uh, uh, very uh essential in, the, in this phase. And we have gallery, galleries in Palestine open selling art, uh, uh, exhibiting art in Dubai, art fair, in uh, every art fair all over the world. Yeah. Uh, so uh, art market has really uh, 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 infiltrated uh, the art scene and shifted the values of what is art and Palestinian art at that time. And on the other hand, the PA took over the, uh, the governance of the art uh, through the Ministry of uh, Culture. And okay. uh, uh, and then they were, grassroots is not there anymore. And it was the PA who dictating what is art, what is art, uh, not art in education, in schools, in uh, the formal settings of the Palestinian Authority. So th there was a shift there. Specifically, then, that's specifically in the West Bank, not in, obviously not in the diaspora and not in uh, 48 and not in uh, Gaza. The, uh, yes. No, Gaza and the West Bank, okay. I would say. And, uh, I mean, it discontinued in both uh, geographies, but in the, it was always marginalized, uh, uh, the art movement in 1948, because uh, the funding, uh, uh, it's a different funding practice. You know, uh, the donors, the international donors for Palestine do not really fund Palestinian artists mm -hmm. in uh, uh, in 1948 because of uh, the political stance and uh, they have different opportunities and other op opportunities but there was always a dialogue uh, even f uh, from the uh, times of the committed art movement in the 70s and 80s there was always a, a collaboration and dialogue uh, uh, but not uh, as much as we we like it to to be 
And now it is happening because this exhibition is full with artists from uh, 1948 uh, and also from uh, uh, from everywhere. Yeah, just all over the place. I want you to keep on going because I'm loving this timeline and I'm curious where we're okay. landing now. But I do have a question at some point. Um, maybe I'll ask the question now and then we'll come back to the timeline, which is I'm curious about how international markets shifted not only the industry, but maybe the output and the dynamics of what we think of as Palestinian art sort of in this post-Oslo period. I would say that, um, yes, it impacted a lot, especially younger generation of artists seeing, uh, you know, the committed artists uh, by, by this time they become very famous, you know, they become old school uh, revolution uh, art. And, and uh, there was a big market in the art fairs for a modernist, uh, this modernist period. And they liked so much uh, to purchase, you know, muse big, mu bigger museums, uh, bigger collectors. And uh, uh, they focused on committed art uh, period and they bought lots of art. And then we have uh, uh, these artists selling uh, suddenly uh, hundreds of thousands sometimes uh, of dollars uh, in terms of one painting. Uh, uh, so younger generation would imitate and emulate uh, such paintings. So we, 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 we realize that so many of the younger generation trying to emulate these artists in order to sell. And they think that this is the art that is really viable. So for me, it's something that you, there's a moment of anachronism that needs to be questioned here. So you're bringing something from the, the, from the past and you just use it now. And the past, it has its own historical, social, political uh, uh, need at that uh, moment. But now it's used at, without this kind of context. So it's very interesting for me that this, mm. the context was the art market, the context is selling, and the context is really following up or, or emulating um, uh, the committed artists in order to sell. So this is one movement. But then uh, another movement uh, uh, that is related to uh, or also the art market is the biennials at the bigger art festivals where uh, Palestinians Palestinian art was really important to be there and represented. And uh, these curators, international curators, they have a different outlook on uh, what is contemporary art practices. And they are always pushing for different direction in the art, video art in a different direction, installations in, in different visuals and different symbolism and values. And this also affected so many of the people who are following, uh, artists who are following such big, big, uh, pursuing big biennials and uh, sort of uh, uh, directing themselves towards uh, a different value in the arts. Uh, artists with international galleries. Mm. Uh, there are international galleries who also pursue uh, Palestinian arts and they define what is good Palestinian art. Uh, plus the donors who give the money into the art to the Palestinian Authority eventually and the uh, civil society organization. They also sort of frame what is art, what is viable in the art, and they give money conditionally uh, in shaping what uh, the West would really like Palestinians to produce in terms of the art. And hence, uh, non-critical art is something that is framed uh, uh, through the uh, international uh, donors. Uh, so, I mean, it's a very complex, layered uh, uh, yeah. history that you cannot really find it. I mean, I, I, I have to go back and they come forward. Yeah. Uh, so it's uh, quite complex. Okay, let's go to, to where we are right now. I mean, like, since, since October 7th, um, do you feel like we have entered artistically also into a new phase of expression and um, uh, approach to um, solidarity and approach to um, this sort of, uh, um, uh, standing up against this, this type of abhorrent violence? Well, yes, I would say, but then it's not only the, uh, I mean, I can see it on, on different levels. Yeah. There's a diff, uh, there's a level of, um, uh, artists. Artists have created several movements, not only, uh, 
the initiative here with the exhibition, uh, but also there is a movement in Bethlehem, for example, uh, um, uh, assembling uh, uh, visual artists, performing artists, musicians, writers, and they decided that they want to go to the public space and uh, reclaim the public space through uh, artistic and literary uh, interventions. And uh, so they've done several meetings as well, and they've uh, done several experimentation uh, in Bethlehem. And there's another movement in Hebron, for example, happening. Um, artists in 1948 are not moving because of censorship and uh, uh, the difficult political conditions. So they're, they're helping here, they're assisting here, they're participating to, uh, in several initiatives here. Uh, however, artists are doing something else abroad. Uh, you know, artists in exile are trying, especially in Germany, they try to boycott uh, the German cultural institutions because uh, uh, these institutions are uh, uh, are uh, complicit in silencing Palestinian identity and voices, yeah. and by by means of you know take uh, uninviting artists to exhibitions or lectures or uh, are denying artists from. Uh, 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 eligible funding uh, or residency opportunities, and uh, so I mean these. Uh, I mean these artists are uh, trying to uh, uh, produce campaigns, uh, trying to uh, uh, bring about networks of solidarity to boycott uh, uh, these institutions and try to uh, intervene in in their spaces uh, through protests and through. Uh, letters of uh, etc cetera, etc cetera. Yeah. so the, the, these are the, these are between here and the exile but then institutions are also working differently so institutions are also faced with the question of what is the role of the institution of the art you cannot really work uh, anymore with conditional funding so no more conditional funding you cannot we really work we need really to follow the art artists and boycott these institutions who are who are essentially uh, uh, censoring Palestinian identity and, uh, and for, for voices against the atrocities uh, conducted by the Israeli uh, colonial regime and it, its alliances as well. Uh, so, um, uh, so institutions are also faced with this question, but it's really difficult for institution to move as quickly as and as flexibly as uh, art, uh, uh, individual artists and uh, collectives. Uh, so uh, they are faced with the issue of funding, and they are also faced with, with uh, an issue of leadership within their uh, ecology. Um, uh, so, I mean, this is something that we also, as Qatar Foundation, are questioning. And uh, so we're trying so much to help Palest uh, Palestinian artists in Gaza to survive this ordeal, uh, to mm. this catastrophe. And at the same time, we're questioning what kind of events and activity. We cannot really do art for entertainment and culture for entertainment Stop. anymore. So uh, uh, culture needs to be part of uh, the community and uh, culture needs to sort of uh, uh, produce new knowledge, produce new ways of uh, lenses of looking at who we are right now. Uh, and culture need, uh, cultural institutions need to host artists and bring about movements of art uh, abroad internationally and also locally in order to uh, induce change and introduce a different narrative of that of the uh, what's happening now in Europe and uh, uh, led by the uh, Zionist movement and its alliances. So the silencing is not any no more. The conditional funding is no more. So how we can really also uh, in, induce uh, or uh, support our own narrative and support our own will rather than being uh, conditionally framed by that of a donor or the European, uh, uh, the white people, uh, yeah. the, the white man's uh, uh, agenda frame. Yeah. yeah. Um, I want to tag that into a, a conversation, a question I had for you, which is um, about another show, another exhi uh, exhibition that you um, co curated um, entitled Mapping Unsolidarities, that was. Um, it uh, started in October 2022, ended at the end of February 2023. I'm going to read a little bit about the description before I ask my question. 
and it says, this exhibition is part of Echoes of Solidarity, a project that probes the epistemologies of solidarities, solidarity within, with the Palestinian struggle, struggle and its political, social, and cultural manifestations inside and outside colonized uh, Palestine. The project is divided into three main plots that intertwine in a non-chronological order. Plot one, Rippling Sounds, is a series of performances in a concert informed by archival research delving into various epochs, namely the Arab Nahda, post-World War II. Plot two, The Question of Palestine, is a series of discursive events that investigate uh, uh, the changes in the meaning of solidarity with the Palestinian struggle as a way to question the shift in the values of the current liberation project. And plot three, Mapping on Solidarities, examines unsolidarity as a mean of questioning the notion of solidarity itself and its demands today. I'm curious how you would think about curating this exhibit post-October 7th. Whoa. Uh, how does unsolidarity, how would you map unsolidarity after the events of October 7th, given what has happened horrifically over the last six months? This is really a tough question because, I mean, mapping unsolidarity was one component of uh, a bigger question on solidarity. And uh, the mapping unsolidarity was particular to the local art scene, was, 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 was uh, tackling the unsolidarity within the art scene. Uh, you know, Maneta, uh, what, does that, what does it mean to, to, to have unsolidarity within the art scene? What does that mean? Uh, because there are clashes, there are divisions, there are tribes, there are, uh, 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 you know, uh, people that are govern uh, different governance in the arts, and there are. Uh, so we we felt like the art scene at that time lacks also internal solidarity. So if if we want a healthier art scene, let's really check what is the unsolidarity there in order for us to establish solidarities as a collective. So it was really questioning the collectivity of the art scene. And uh, uh, one of the artists, I mean, this was really something that backfired on us without really even noticing, because one of the artists, uh, she's a Finnish artist who we commissioned to come and uh, 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 she works with gossip maps. She produces maps based on gossips. Uh, uh, in the art scene. She did, did that in uh, Ljubljana, in uh, uh, Istanbul, and in other places around the world. And uh, But this one was really different because uh, artists took it really personal. And there was big clash and, uh, between the artist himself and big clash with the foundation. Uh, we, we, she tries to take gossip as a social, uh, social practice, whereby it is. It is. Uh, it's not a, a truth as much as it's a, a space of uh, people intending or intending to project uh, emotions and project uh, uh, opinions, uh, whether based on uh, uh, empirical uh, evidence or not. But then, uh, these opinions and uh, emotions, these emotions, uh, need to be collected in uh, the art scene uh, for the artists and. And uh, what she did is actually she tried to triangulate uh, these uh, gossips. So she doesn't really take a gossip from me directly. As, but if she felt that there's a resonance somewhere else with the gossip, she tries to triangulate them and then put them. So uh, this is the verification method that she uses. And uh, she's done the whole institutions uh, as uh, uh, she drew all the institutions as circles and also individuals who are influential in the art scene and then wow. she had the gossips written all over so, <laughs> so it was a big map Crazy. and we 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 sort of displayed it like a huge billboard in the exhibition so there this idea of a billboard which is uh promotional uh which is uh trying to promote something uh via neoliberal uh means of display and uh and that was really even more 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 uh, uh, irritating for artists because it's in in your face. And then people started reading, and we got so many official complaints from artists uh, saying that we need this to be taken out. Uh, so with the co-curator Boyana Piskur, we 
decided to do redaction. So each artist who, uh, or, or individual in the art scene who did not like what uh, the gossip is saying, it's a gossip, it's not the truth. Uh, yeah. So we redacted their part. So it became even more irritating for artists because it's uh, as if it's uh, they're censoring their gossip, the gossips on them. So it was really a fun project for me, but uh, uh, artists decided, so many of the people decided not to, to, uh, to not boycott, but then not to, not to, uh, to boycott the exhibition, but not also to be in, um, in collaboration with the Qatan Foundation on different projects. Mm. Uh, but now things, uh, things are different, definitely. Well, the question of how do I curate this exhibition uh, now, I would say uh, something happened, uh, an initiative was online. I don't remember the name of the initiative. They tried to list all the international Arab and local cultural institution and mm. see if they were with, uh, they, they were officially through their uh, manifestos, whether they are really with uh, uh, the Palestinians, supporting Palestinian or they're silent. So they wanted to sort of expose all these silent institutions who didn't have a say in what is happening to the Palestinians now. So there is something that is happening. So there's no need for an exhibition because it, uh, so many initiatives are uh, working on that, uh, trying to use fadiha uh, as a means of, hmm. uh, of exposing and a means of also pushing people to have, uh, uh, have a solidarity a st a stance uh, towards what is happening in Gaza and in Palestine now. Uh, so uh, I won't really go to in curating this exhibition, but then, the question of Palestine, that component would really be something essential. Yeah. It's a continuation of Edward Said's work from 1978. They're the same book, the same title. And I think reading the introduction of that book, uh, it's as if the same things that Said is really putting in the introduction is happening in Gaza. And now it's it's a it's a cyclical relationship, but different dates and different uh, 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 different forms of violence. Uh, but then the same the same the same the same thing happening. So it's essential to really go back to the question of Palestine in terms of the language we use. Uh, so what kind of lexicon are we uh, uh, using? And now this happened in this uh, this uh, uh, assault and this uh, genocide. So language is part of that bigger global struggle uh, for defining what is Palestine and the question of Palestine. So now what is terrorism and how it's defined by us Palestinians versus what is being imposed by the international uh, 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 alliances with Israel. So uh, the formal, also the formal setting of, uh, regardless whether alliance alliances or not, but the for formal state position in terms of what language is used to define what is happening now is something very essential. So us as Palestinians, we're continuously in an erasure in terms of what kind of language as Palestinians we want to use, not to be, uh, uh, not to uh, use the projection of what other uh, other are using against us to to define us. So this is very essential as part of what is the question of Palestine today. It's very important to re-establish this lexicon of how we define terrorism, how we define uh, Hamas, and uh, how we define um, the, our right to uh, rebel against our occupiers. Uh, what is liberation for us? What is resistance for us? Is something that either people need to take it or we don't want to have any relationship to them. Uh, I think it's about time that we have this moment and stand that this is what we want to do. This is our definitions. You want to work with the, our definitions. You're more than welcome. You're an ally. You don't want to. You don't want. We we don't want to work with you. So this is something that needs to take place at the cultural art scene. Uh, yeah. Uh, right now. Do you feel like the way you're talking, Azid, which Anna, I'm with you 100, percent but. Do you feel like the core audience of your exhibits right now are actually the artists? True. I mean, this exhibition is done for the artists, for the artists, by the artists. And it's a, a research space rather than it's a display of uh, artworks and display of beautiful paintings or expressive paintings that can be sold and that the money goes for to Gaza art, uh, the, the art scene in Gaza. To uh, But that's not only the point. 
It's, yeah. an ex it's a research into the art. It's a space where we can really look at the art and question art practices and who we are. Let me ask you a very simple question that probably has a complicated answer. Can Palestinian art, can the Palestinian artists survive without applying to European and Western funding from institutions and governments that support the Zionist colonial project? Well, this is a very interesting question. I uh, My answer would be simply at a certain point in time where the committed art, art movement happened, there was no funding. Uh, artists uh, worked as uh, uh, to, I mean, they worked as an artist. They didn't work on it. There was no job as an artist. So they have, uh, uh, Sliman was teaching, Vera was teaching, uh, Taisir was, had a restaurant or something, I don't know what. So they have a different uh, source of income. They have different jobs, uh, but then they had studios and they practiced art. They, they used to, uh, uh, the income from their jobs supported their practice at that time. So uh, if uh, if we reconceptualize what is art and uh, what is art institutions in in that kind of direction, whereby it's not dependent on international art, uh, uh, international aid and donation, yes, the, the the question is yes, but but because of the ecology, as you said, and because of the network of the Palestinian art scene that is really covering the globe. I mean, there are Palestinian artists in Latin America as well. So you cannot really control the whole scene, definitely. But, uh, but, uh, and there are, there will be uh, some of the artists dependent on international uh, conditional funding. Of course, you cannot really uh, prohibit that because, as, uh, um, uh, but then we are hoping, we are hoping that there will be a, a, a renaissance, uh, 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 a consciousness, a moment of consciousness whereby there are other alternative practices can really take uh, place in the art scene. And then, on the other hand, changing the mentality of the donor and only working with those who would really respect our lexicon, our values, our definitions as Palestinians. It, when an artist comes to you and you know talks to you about one of these shows, are you trying to get them to stop applying for these funds? Are you trying to say, you can do it, it's possible. You should be... You should be um, you know, m maybe boycotting is the right word. You should be boycotting these uh, funds. They shouldn't have the privilege of working with you. They shouldn't have the privilege of supporting you. Well, I say it, but then I'm, I, I don't think that uh, it's my position to do that. Yeah. Uh, I think if whenever I, I, I can discuss that and then artists should really decide on their own because huh. you cannot really force people to do that. Yeah. Uh, if you don't really believe in it, uh, you want, yeah. I mean, my words wouldn't really affect you. So I don't have the power to do that anyway. And um, I don't want to be in that position of really forcing people to do things yeah. or trying to manipulate the way they think. But then I'm very vocal about it. That, uh, But then I'm privileged. I'm in the Qatam Foundation as a curator. And uh, it's one of the foundations that are still running and it still have a, uh, 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 a sustained uh, income that can survive uh, make the institution survive uh, the coming dark times and dark days that are uh, coming. But then I cannot really tell artists from that position what to do, especially those who who rely so much on uh, uh, art in terms of their uh, 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 everyday life, yeah. uh, everyday expenses. And so, yeah. Uh, yeah. Let me ask you a different question. I want to I want to switch to two other exhibits. Um, that you uh, were uh, curating for, which one is instant modernism and the other is the forensic architecture assembly, assembled practices. Um, both of which, and, and, and to some degree weed control, um, both look at aspects of control and aspects of um, oppression that are not necessarily immediately obvious. Um, whether it's architecture, infrastructure, controlling f flora, um, seed banks, and things like that. Can you walk me through um, how you approach 
curating those and kind of what you're hoping people walk away from when you when you put uh, those types of e exhibitions together? Uh, this is really a, a very interesting question because it tells so much about the way I think as a curator. Um, I'm very interested in uh, in knowledge production and that knowledge production that does not state the obvious. Uh, as Agamben would say, it's the space where uh, I'm, I'm interested not what is under the light as much as what is in the dark. So I'm trying to excavate the darkness rather than what is so obvious and in front of us all the time that people talk about all the time. I'm interested in those dark moments where, uh, for example, in history that did not partake in making our present. Uh, so, I mean, these moments in our hist history that stopped from, uh, that, that vanished and uh, that were not really brought with us in our, our practices and our memory today. I'm interested why these moments in history stopped, why these dark moments are dark and not under the highlight today. And why am I doing that? Because it's very important for me to project it to the present and the future. What kind of us, what kind of possibility of us these moments would have produced and mm. what kind of alter alternatives of who we are right now those moments would have produced? And this is a question of uh, us today and also projecting to the future. Uh, our identity, our, the way we comprehend who we are, uh, where we're going, what kind of politics, what kind of society, what kind of values we we uphold. Uh, uh, so this is this is the way I look at uh, knowledge production. And in these three exhibitions, specifically, I mean, the archive in instant modernism was something that is hidden from us in private collections and. Uh, uh, owned by Israeli architects and Israeli families. And it was brought uh, in that book that I found, okay, but this is not a, an Israeli author who is producing uh, 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 an archive on the history of Israeli architecture. It's actually the history of architecture as a tool of uh, oppression and annihilation and uh, so I, I looked at it from a different perspective mm. I thought that this is our history these images are our are, 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 are archives not their archive uh, so if you flip you, the way you look at the the archive you find it really interesting and you find uh, prospects and uh, uh, imaginaries that normally you uh, if you if you have that kind of antagonism with it it's like ah it's an Israeli book an Israeli author and I don't want to have a look at it. I mean, I think you lose a lot because can you, you can really flip it around. Oh, yeah, yeah please. can you talk a little bit, can you just at least uh, talk about the books or the object of Zionism? Can you talk a little bit uh, about what this book is? Because just like you, most people have not heard of this book who are listening to this uh, podcast. And I think there is a, a lot of value there. Well, uh, uh, The Object of Zionism is a book by uh, an architect, an Israeli architect called Spi Efrat. Uh, and the book traces back the history of architecture and urban planning uh, uh, for the whole Israeli Zionist project uh, from uh, end of 18th century until, until today. So it tra traces all the theories in architecture and urban planning and the experimentation especially during World War uh, I, uh, where modernist architecture became become a tool of uh, reconstructing Europe at that time, after the war, sorry, World War II, uh, after, uh, and then instant architecture become, a, you know, concrete, a huge building to, in order to get uh, to uh, uh, house all these people who are uh, refugees everywhere in Europe. So uh, the, the same instant architecture has been used simultaneously in Palestine in order to host the uh, waves of immigrants, uh, uh, Israeli Zionist Im immigrants coming to Palestine unofficially by the British mandate at that time. Uh, so uh, uh, so you can see the, the, uh, the global international history uh, 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 juxtaposed with the local Palestinian cause. And then you see an international, uh, international history of the theory of architecture and urban planning is juxtaposed at that uh, moment in Palestine. And the way this it has been used as tools of 
planning, uh, uh, you know, uh, displacement, the uh, erasure of uh, Palestinians at that time. Uh, so this is the, the whole book is really situated in that kind of history. Uh, and I, I'm using it to highlight my, my own interpretation of the same tools, the way it has been used to, uh, f uh, uh, as a colonial tool for, uh, you know, uh, colonizing Palestine. Yeah. What was the response? What was the response to that type of thing? I know, I mean, in Lebanon, for example, um, there is an immediate knee-jerk reaction. So if you are trying to, um, if you're trying to critically look at Israeli sources to, to learn and understand the architecture of how they're thinking and how they're constructing this nation building in their own imagination, if only to deconstruct it, if only to understand how this was created, there's a knee-jerk reaction, which is, no, 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 don't, don't read anything. Don't look at anything. Just control A, delete, you know, <laughs> don't. <laughs> and so how was the reaction to do that from, from Ramallah? Well, to be honest, it was a difficult exhibition because uh, at the beginning it took some, yani, uh, at the beginning, uh, we wanted this exhibition to be also archived uh, so the the initial form was a huge archive where universities, architects also contribute to an, uh, uh, an in, with argumentation against the content of that book within the archive. But it didn't work out because so many movements of students and architects are all over the world, especially Palestinians, were against it. And we heard that people are complaining. Uh, the open call didn't really attract so many people. I mean, we were expecting hundreds like normal, but it uh, we had seven or eight uh, entries and we were shocked. Uh, so we had to, I uh, had to change the format and I commissioned artists that I know that they are open-minded and uh, for them, uh, it's not about knowledge, where knowledge comes from. It's, uh, as Foucault would say, it's, uh, you know, be critical about the archaeology of knowledge, uh, critical about how you really handle knowledge. And if you you have a critical mind, you shouldn't really be uh, afraid of dealing with any kind of written knowledge. I mean, uh, I think this is the essence of why knowledge is there is uh, and why knowledge is produced by so many people, so many regimes and so many ideologies. And then we you know, cannot yeah, you need to be critical towards knowledge every day, every time. I mean, what you hear from the newspaper, what you what you listen and watch on Jazeera or CNN or BBC, or what you read in a book uh, 40 years ago uh, versus what you read about. So you need to be critical anyway towards any knowledge. And, yeah. But that doesn't mean that you cannot deal with what, whatever knowledge that is offered in front of you if you find a way of using that knowledge and utilize it to answer questions that are very important today. Um, uh, so this is the way I deal with knowledge. And I think this kind uh, this taboos, uh, these taboos and these are, I think we, we uh, I, at least I don't feel like I want to even discuss it with the, these people. Uh, well, the, the exhibition, after the opening of the exhibition, we were, we were amazed that this is, was one of the most ex successful exhibitions we, we had at the Qatar. People came and they asked for even more material to be uh, to be read. And they asked us, when are we going to publish the material? Ah, because it's very interesting to them. Mm -hmm. And we had uh, visits from international, uh, international uh, uh, architects, students in architecture. So it was really a very important and huge exhibition, very successful one. Amazing. Um... Yazid, right now, um, if somebody's listening to this in Chile or Berlin or Beirut or uh, anywhere, um, where can they find out more about the exhibition, um, about the past ex exhibitions, and how can they learn about this stuff? Well, uh, to be honest, uh, the Qatan Foundation uh, uh, website is under construction, so I would really, uh, in, in order for them to read about the exhibitions, uh, it's much better to go to Universes in Universe. Uh, it's a website with, uh, that documents especially Arab, Arab exhibitions and also international exhibitions, but then focused on the Arab region as well. 
And uh, we have all the exhibition of the Qatan Foundation listed there, so they can really uh, go to the Qatan and then see all the exhibitions. The, just browse there and explore. Amazing. And see the images. So I'm going to read it out. So it's universes, uh, U-N-I-V-E-R-S-E-S dot -E art. And then um, you can search uh, the Qatan Foundation. And then there's a bunch of stuff on there. Um, it's it's pretty amazing. So uh, definitely go check that stuff out. Um, Yazid, uh, thank you so much for your work um, and for joining us. Um, it's really been an honor to have you on. Thank you so much for uh, for hosting me. It was really interesting, all these questions and to delve in. I feel like every topics. question I asked you, you said, oh, this is a hard question. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, it is. But then it was really uh, enjoyable. Yeah. And, um, and I, I had fun. Thanks so much. Okay, everybody, so um, much. check out the rest of the series on YouTube um, and on Spotify and Rami, Apple, wherever you find your podcasts. Thanks so much. 